November 11th, 1942, a nation of war pauses briefly to pay tribute to its dead of other wars. by Franklin, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and General John J. Pershing at the Arlington National Cemetery, the nation will observe a minute of silence at exactly 11 a.m. Eastern wartime. The presidential party arrived just a moment ago, and now the president is standing with General Pershing and Captain McCray, his naval aide at his left, directly in front of the strikingly simple unknown soldier's tomb, and the wreath of yellow chrysanthemums is being placed on the tomb, which bears the inscription, He arrests in honored glory, an American soldier known but to God. Now the ruffles and flourishes. ceremony during which the President of the United States placed a wreath of yellow chrysanthemums on the tomb of the unknown soldier, which is strikingly simple and austere and made of white marble. Now the official automobile is driving up to the point at which the President is standing with his naval aide Captain McCray and General John J. Pershing, and the President will get in the car with his aides and military leaders of the nation and drive over to the amphitheater, which is just beyond the unknown soldier's tomb, and at that point the ceremony will continue with an address of welcome by Major Joseph J. Malloy of the United States Army, National Chairman of the American Legion Armistice Day Committee. We take you now to the amphitheater. Speaking from the amphitheater in Arlington National Cemetery, the National Memorial Park has war dead and dead of other wards. The ceremony We'll begin here in a few moments with the arrival of the President of the United States and his aides upon the podium above the crowd that's assembled here in this gorgeous amphitheater of white marble. The amphitheater, standing for some distance, the ground surrounding it over the surrounding Arlington National Cemetery, set in the midst of natural beauty, of extreme beauty, 
just across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. This beautiful reservation is laid out several thousands of acres beyond the new Pentagon building, stretching this side and far back to Fort Myer from the Potomac River. At this moment, filing into the amphitheater is the United States Army Band, which will play in a few moments under the direction of Captain Thomas F. Darcy. Following their playing, on the arrival of the president, they will interrupt the number that they are in progress with at that moment and play the ruffles and flourishes, the honors paid to the president on his arrival in this amphitheater. While this is going on, the president is moving into the amphitheater with his party, and after a moment's rest inside, we'll proceed on out to the presidential stand to begin his broadcast. The address of welcome to the president and to the people assembled here will be delivered by Major Joseph J. Malloy of the United States Army, retired, the national chairman of the American Legion Armistice Day Committee. All around this amphitheater, we see American flags hanging downward with a field of stars in the upper left-hand corner, as is the official custom of the United States Army. And back, stretching from the roof and on down to the walk, are great extended banners of the United States flag. The United States Army Band continues to file in, are taking their places in front of the president's stand. This is a scene of great solemnity. The crowd's attitude is changed from that of other years. Their attitude, of course, is changed because of their thoughts concerning the war that is now going on. But there is a spirit of bright hopefulness on the part of all those assembled here because of the successes that America has gained in the last few weeks of this war in connection and in conjunction with their allies. Just a brief word of description about the Memorial Amphitheater. It was completed in 1920, and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier was completed in 1931. A green lawn stretching broadly into the distance, 300 feet in length, bordered by clipped hedges sloping gently upward to a broad granite steps mounting to a paved form of terrace, surrounds the amphitheater. Dark clumps of boxwood and groves of cedar add to the atmosphere of solemnity and repose surrounding the tomb of the unknown soldier. The main feature of the Arlington Memorial Amphitheater is an elliptical amphitheater seating about 4,000 people. And I might add, by way of comment, that this amphitheater is thoroughly filled this morning. A stately colonnade having an outer wall penetrated with a graceful arcade surrounds the pit and provides the several thousand additional seats needed on an occasion of this kind. The circumference of the hole measures nearly one-eighth of a mile, while at the west and east ends there are stately pavilions. And now at this moment, the United States Army Band, under the direction of Captain Thomas F. Darcy, strikes up Hail America.
We're waiting for the President of the United States to make his entrance. The American Legion is going through with a certain ceremony which precedes the entrance of the President. The colors have been masked. The beautiful United States banners edged in gold lace are masked to the right of the speaker's stand from which the President will make his address, while the American Legion banners and the banners of the American Legion Auxiliary are massed to the left of the president's stand. A very colorful ceremony has taken place while the band music was going on. The colors have now been massed to completion. American Legion flag, the red banner of the American Legion, is on the left of the president's stand, a place of honor, while the United States flag, displayed all throughout the amphitheater, also has a place of honor on the right of the speaker's platform. The ceremonies continue before the president comes in. I might comment at this time on the presence of armed sentries of the United States Army placed at spaced intervals on top of the colonnade here in the amphitheater. It's a sight that is not generally seen on top of the colonnade, but in this time of war, we do find the soldiers placed in that position where they may command a view of the entire crowd in the amphitheater. Everyone is on their feet at the moment, waiting for the president to come in. There will be a slight delay before he does get into the amphitheater to receive the welcome from Major Malloy and to make his address to the nation. In company with the president are his military and naval aides and also former chief of staff and commanding general of the United States Armed Forces in France during the last war, General John J. Pershing, has honored this entire gathering with his presence. There's a distinguished assemblage of people sitting before the speaker's stand, and everyone is on their feet awaiting the president. Might continue at this point with a further description of the Arlington National Cemetery Amphitheater. Except for a few interior details, the whole structure is of white marble quarried at Danby, Vermont. The architects model it chiefly after the theater of Dionysius at Athens and the Roman theater at Orange, France. Now there is a tremendous roar of applause as the president of the United States walks into the scene in the arms of his aide, General Watson. He steps now to the speaker's stand, makes his appearance before the crowd. And now, Major Malloy, following the rebels and flourishes to the President of the United States. Hail to the chief. Here is Major Malloy. President Roosevelt, General Pershing, National Commander Waring, and other distinguished guests, comrades, and friends. The American Legion extends to all present and to those listening by radio a cordial welcome to these services in the National Memorial Amphitheater in Arlington Cemetery. On this armistice day, and in the years to come, it is fitting that the members of the American Legion assemble at the tomb of the unknown soldier to do honor and homage to one of our departed comrades whose creed, color, and name we do not know. We do know that he symbolizes loyalty, allegiance, and service to his country. The war during which he gave his life ended 24 years ago, and many of us have returned to service. We are grateful for the privilege of serving our country and carrying forward the noble purposes of the founders of the American Legion. Here today, in the presence of our Commander-in-Chief and our General of the Armies, we renew our pledge to service for God and country, 
hopeful that with divine guidance we may achieve a more complete realization of the ideals for which we fight. Reverend Paul D.F. Mortimer, National Chaplain of the American Legion, will pronounce the invocation. Almighty God, Thou who hast been our strength in all the ages past, and to whom we look for guidance and for blessing and for help in all the years to come, bless us this day, we pray. Give unto us thy Holy Spirit that we may more perfectly fulfill thy wishes and thy desires. May we more than we ever have before lead all nations in the worship of God, the honor and glory of God, and in the establishment of a nation which shall be exemplary to all. Bless, we pray thee, our leaders, that each one may be given wisdom and guidance as they guide us in these days. We remember, O God, lovingly those departed comrades who this day specially memorize us. And may our devotion to our country and to all that is dear to us and to thee be as great as theirs. And may our love to thee and to country one day give to us the reward with thee of life everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Here in Arlington, we are in the presence of the honored dead. And I think that we are accountable to them. Accountable to the generations yet unborn for whom they gave their lives. Today, as on all armistice days since 1918, our thoughts go back to the First World War. And we remember with gratitude the bravery of the men who fought and helped to win that fight against German militarism. But this year, our thoughts are also very much of the living present, of the future, which we begin to see opening before us, a picture illumined by a new light of hope. Today, Americans and their British brothers in arms are again fighting on French soil. They are again fighting against a German militarism which transcends a hundredfold the brutality and the barbarism of 1918. The Nazis of today and their appropriate associates, the Japanese, have attempted to drive history into reverse, to use all the mechanics of modern civilization to drive humanity back to conditions of prehistoric savagery. They sought to conquer the world, and for a time they seemed to be successful in realizing their boundless ambition. They overran great territories. They enslaved. They killed. But today we know and they know that they have conquered nothing. Today they face inevitable, final defeat. Yes, the forces of liberation are advancing. Britain, Russia, China, 
and the United States grow rapidly toward full strength. The opponents of decency and justice have passed their peak. And as a result of recent events, very recent, the United States and the United Nations forces are being joined by large numbers of the fighting men of our traditional ally, France. <laughs> On this day of all days, it is heartening for us to know that the soldiers of France go forward with the United Nations. The American unknown soldier who lies here did not give his life on the fields of France merely to defend his American home for the moment that was passing. He gave it that his family, his neighbors, and all his fellow Americans might live in peace in days to come. His hope was not fulfilled. American soldiers are giving their lives today in all continents and on all the seas in order that the dream of the unknown soldier may come true at last. All the heroism, all the unconquerable devotion that free men and women are showing in this war shall make certain the survival and the advancement of civilization. That is why on this day of remembrance, we do not cease from our work. We are going about our tasks in behalf of our fighting men everywhere, our thoughts turn in gratitude to those who have saved our nation in days gone by. We stand in the presence of the honored dead. We stand accountable to them and to the generations yet unborn for whom they gave their lives. God, the Father of all living, watches over these hallowed graves and blesses the souls of those who rest here. May he keep us strong in the courage that will win the war, and may he impart to us the wisdom and the vision that we shall need for true victory in the peace which is to come. At this moment, great events are taking place in France and Africa. And I think it is particularly appropriate that we greet here today the General of the Armies of the United States. And I know that I speak for all of you here. I know that I speak for all Americans, men, women, and children, in every part of this great land, when I extend our American affectionate greetings to General Pershing. 